we shall uh, start now the second part of uh, the session and uh, we welcome the distinguished uh, panelists um, <coughs> Uh, Professor uh, Benoit Vermander and Professor Peng Xiaoyu. Um, first speaker is, uh, in fact, uh, Professor Benoit Vermander, uh, a Jesuit, professor of uh, religious studies in the School of Philosophy of Fudan University in Shanghai. He was director of the Taipei Ricci Institute from 1996 to 2009, where I had the I was lucky enough to know him. Uh, he has written extensively on religion and spiritualities in today's China. His latest contribution being entitled Shanghai Sacred, the Religious Landscape of the Global Cities, co-authored with uh, uh, Liz Hingley and Liang Zhang uh, in 2018. He has also authored works on Chinese minorities in Southwest China, intercultural dialogue, cultural diversity and sustainable development. Professor's, uh, uh, Professor Vermander's presentation is about uh, uh, Christianity in Chinese society, memories, challenges and assets. Over to you, Professor, thanks. Is that working? Yes. So, we are going to start indeed, and the theme explored in this conference indeed is very large, but let's take it as an encouragement to identify in a maze of data and experience a thread through which to assess the status of Christianity in today's China, the shared or conflicting memories of Christian communities and of the Chinese nation as a whole, and finally, the way these communities and the state can best manage the challenges that they are presently meeting. In other words, I give three goals to my presentation. First, trying to present an overarching narrative of historical interaction. Second, specifying questions raised by the debated need for sinicization of the Christian churches. And finally, boldly, sketching a kind of blueprint that may be shared by state authorities and religious believers. So first, I will try to make sense somehow, to give an interpretation of the whole history of Christianity in China. So not wasting on details, but rather trying to find some uh, way of understanding or giving a kind of interpretation of what happened. We know that Christianity and Islam so after entered China by the Silk Road, and for long they were confined to the margins of civil society. It is only from the 17th century onward that they sinicide their written social and ritual expression. The arrival of Catholicism at the end of the 16th century was accompanied by intense intercultural and interreligious dialogue, sometimes compared by some Chinese thinkers, including my colleague Li Tiangong, who is here today, to what the Renaissance was in Europe. Of course, the atmosphere, we all know that, was different after 1843, when missionaries returned with military support. It is also from this period that religions in China became more confessional or congregational, often marked by hostility between rival communities. The tormented hours of 19th and 20th centuries saw, among other phenomena, affirmation of Christianity as a specific social form, surge of messianic army of the Taiping, revolt, anti-Christian revolt of the boxers, internal reform of Buddhism, entry into modernity of Buddhism and other Chinese religion, and finally, in the 1930s, the formation of new Chinese religions that have been repressed in mainland China but are still active in Taiwan, for instance. So those are some illustrations of that time just for putting some imagery into it. This is a Jesuit orphanage 
of Zikawei in Shanghai, in which little orphans were tossed artistic uh, crafts, though it was somehow sinicization, while it was at the same time Western forms of art that were tossed and that uh, somehow shaped the first generation of Western art Chinese artists in Shanghai and China. Okay, sorry. And uh, this is a Xu Jiahui Seologate, so in Shanghai too, in 1935. It's good to remember this kind of society within the society at large that uh, the church was at this time, and it looks a bit like a small Gregorian university in Shanghai, no? Something like that. <laughs> of course, the one of 1935, I mean. So, after 1911, the Chinese Republic promoted the development of national and modern religions, which were opposed to superstitions. This vocabulary is still present, of course. National religious associations were co-opted by the states in the 1930s, so before the new regime, and the new regime reformatted them according to its need from 1949 onwards. But somehow, shaping national religious association deemed to be modern is something that dates, dates from the Chinese Republic. Not without resistance, especially vivying among Christians and Catholic, the state then, after 1949, assured its control over religious organization and activity. After the turmoil of the Cultural Revolution, framework governing the relationship between state and religion was reaffirmed on the basis established immediately after 1949. So strong continuity from Chinese Republic to the communist state and till now, the process of cooperation conflict between the two parties concerned continues still today. More images for illustrating what I mean. Here is a Catholic fisherman on the outskirts of Taiwan, photographed two years ago at Eastern Time, genuflecting in front of his house uh, while a procession is circling the village where he lives. So it's an image both of the past and today in many respects, okay? And of popular devolution still living on. He's a fisherman, you can see that because there are some symbols of that, except that he doesn't fish anymore since a long time. Being a fisherman and a Catholic are both part of his identity, whatever he does, but he doesn't live through the trade of being a fisherman. It's an identity. Another image, which is in the Francis, Francis Xavier Church in Shanghai, this is the Altar of, uh, I would say, filial piety, if you want, of the dead, record, uh, recollections of the dead, with four masses a year celebrated in this specific chapel, with a calendar that mixes Chinese traditional calendar and Christian calendar, and you could see the photographs of the two former bishops, the one dead in 2012, Monsignor Jean, and the one dead the year after, Monsignor Fan, who were, as you know, Conovices, both Jesuit and Conovices. Okay, so this is an illustration of the kind of balance, cultural, political, and so on, historical balances that Catholic Christians are still trying to achieve. So this is a one-minute commercial. Those pictures are taken by Liz Hingley, which is a co-author of a book I wrote with her and uh, Zhang Liang which tries to describe religious species in Shanghai as a whole and not no Catholicism only, but the way it integrates itself into the religious landscape of a global city. And the book is coming out exactly those days this week. So end of the commercial, but pictures are mostly from Liz Ingle. So, Taking all that in, uh, into account, we could say that the present status of Catholicism in China remains that of a religion at the margin. In Hebei, Shanxi, Shanxi, and other provinces, the strong identity of Christian villages traditionally equated with a minority ethnic group. 
in the city, the network of schools and hospitals gave the church greater visibility, but it structured also network that functioned autonomously. Contemporary Chinese Catholicism, therefore, always seems a bit like an heterodox religion. Somehow, since the 18th century, it never went out of this kind of psychological collective status. So we all know that Catholicism was mainly popular and rural for a long time, and it maintained its own traditions until the movement of Exodus towards the cities in the first decades of the 21st century. So something extremely important, it already appears that this movement of urbanization has deeply shaken the traditional structure of Chinese Catholicism. Chinese Catholicism today, independently from any political factor, is on the, moon, on the move, is in crisis. One still cannot assert whether the blows to rural Catholicism have been or will be offset by the appearance of a new urban Catholicism. I put that picture because it represents the traditional gate of a Chinese village. And you see how that kind of gate creates an enclosure. So when you had a Chinese Catholic village, it was living in a world of its own, in a cosmos, a microcosmos, structured by such a gate that was somehow defining a whole little universe. Okay? So can Catholicism in China go beyond such gates remains somehow the question. Okay? Here another image that reminds you in the, the memories of Chinese Catholic today, or at least the ones who come from Chinese uh, families, even if that kind of memories is already far away from a new generation of Catholic, like this one, a happy young Catholic couple in a parish of Shanghai, preparing to attend together a Teze prayer session. So maybe an expression of this new urban Catholicism connected with global networks, the one of the prayer network somehow, and who somehow has already forgotten much of what has been happening during the last 60 years. Okay? So conflicting images of a Catholicism on the move. Let's go further into this tormented history to interpret it somehow. My main point, and I have to skip a lot of my presentation here, is that, especially after 1843, but it was true even before, the uh, Christianity in China will come with a form of kenosis when missionaries came again after 1843, the re their return was linked to a process of national humiliation triggered by unequal treaties and, partly as a consequence of the former, the type of guidance provided by the missionaries in that colonial or quasi-colonial style. Well, a case this point is the one of the communities in Shanghai. They had functioned in autarky uh, from middle of 18th century to middle of 19th century. And they were governed through local Catholic clans who were managing church with the help or even the leadership, it should be said, of an informal group of consecrated virgins. Okay? Foreign missionaries were horrified by such structure and somehow normalized the structure of the church with the help of French feminine congregations. That's a form of kenosis also for Chinese Christians who lived through those changes. Okay? An historian, Henrietta Harrison, has provided with a roving account of the lived experience of Chinese Christianity in a Shanxi village. Okay? You still have stories going on. Some story she called the Chinese priest who ran away to, run, to Rome because indeed he went to Rome for complaining about the treatment that local clergy was receiving from foreign missionaries. There are tales of missionaries beating or cursing villagers. 
but there are also stories of Catholics confessing their faith or dying for it during the Boxer religion as during Cultural Revolution. So on all sides, it is a history of kenosis. And today in the same village, the devotion of the parishioner to Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, whose shrine stands over the village, is vivified by such multi-layered story. So Our Lady of Seven Sorrows, if you want, is Christianity being sinicide. This is a paradox. Both stories and religious practices belong in the villagers, in villagers' present day lives. But in them, the long history of their community is revealed. Okay? Same thing could be said for the Catholic fisherman of Shanghai, of which I have shown images. There are devotions that belong to world Catholicism, but they are deeply embedded by local memories. Okay. There are other ways in which this kenosis could be expressed, and I think it's good we stop for thinking about it. I'm quoting here a translation of the memoirs of Bishop Jin Lucien, first official bishop of Shanghai after 1980, who died now five years ago. It might shock some of us, but I think it's good to be confronted by that. During my 27 years in jail, every day I sang to myself the song, The Society of Jesus is My Mother, believing that all the Jesuits in the world were praying for me, from which shows I derived both peace of mind and inner strength. What I could not have imagined was that when my adopted German mother came to see me and then rushed to Rome, to see the Jesuit leaders to tell them the happy news that I was still among the living, the deputy superior general who met with her would sternly tell her that I was a traitor and was no longer recognized as a Jesuit. When I had received my adopter mother's letter, I really felt as if a sword had pierced my heart. That was the most painful moment of all my 27 years of lost liberty. I'm not commenting this passage, but it's part of the file that has to be put uh, under our eyes. Though the insistence on humiliation that can be felt in Jean Lucien memoirs, not only this passage, humiliation that comes under many forms, is a notable feature of the kenotic experience as lived and retold by Chinese Christians. So, second question, Treating it from that background, should Christianity today become more Chinese? And I think already we feel that the question is a complex one if we take into account this historical background. So we know that especially for the last three years, the Chinese leadership has repeatedly calling religions or religion to sinicize. Zhongguohua. Okay. So, the report of Xi Jinping of October 2070s says, we will fully implement the party's basic policy on religious affairs, uphold the principle that religion in China must be Chinese in orientation. Here I quote the official translation, so what is here said must be Chinese in orientation, in Chinese it's just Yao Zhongguohua, okay? and provide active guidance to religions, though they can adapt themselves to socialist society. Provide active guidance to religions. Okay. This has been taken by several religions. So for instance, statement of Taoist Association, it's too long, so I will not read the entirety of it. Uh, where shall we start? Uh, we will strengthen the guiding role of patriotism, collectivism, and socialism and see that the people develop an accurate understanding of history, ethnicity, country, and culture. Okay, so this is a goal that the Taoist Association fixes to itself. There are also texts now, especially since three to four months, since you have many study sessions about what it means to Zhongguohua. Okay, so here I gathered several texts, but I use specifically the terms. The faithful must follow the party's leadership and adhere to socialist values. On this basis, they must work towards three goals, more Chinese religious values, 
more Chinese religious symbols and more Chinese practices of the faith. Okay. So this is what officially is meant by Zhong Rohua. Now I'm entering my own, uh, maybe my blueprint somehow, I dare to do that, okay. It seems clear that on the one hand, blind and reflective, uh, and reflective compliance to directives that still today remain vague, because what I s just read is precise and very vague at the same time, what it means to have a more Chinese practice of the faith, is uh, the first trap to be avoided at all costs. There cannot be a blind follow-up of that vague directive. However, a second trap needs also to be detected. Christian churches should not neglect the call to sinicize because it comes from the government. The right attitude for Christians, it seems to me, is probably to hear the call and to examine what changes it may lead them to imagine and implement, while remaining keenly aware of the dangers this might create. The church somehow is not stranger to that challenge because it always has been in constant remodeling. It never has had its structure being stabilized, okay? The Nestorians had to cooperate with Buddhist and Taoist monks in order to provide for adequate translation and expression of their creeds, okay? And in that way, they also influenced the writing of some Taoist masters, especially for a case which is well documented, the famous, famous patriarch Lu Dongbin, in which you find hymns to the Trinity in very clear language. Evangelization as conducted by Protestants and Catholics from 1842 or three onwards often lacked cultural sensitivity. It mixed the gospel message with cultural elements foreign to it. However, real acculturation happens through a process of popular appropriation that nobody can truly master. Today, as I already said, speaking about, for instance, Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, better not to tell a Chinese Christian that reciting the Rosary or the Litanies or singing Zush or Zush sacred melody uh, is a Western thing. She probably learned this devotion through her mother or grandmother. And they are as Chinese for her as they are French or Italian for the faithful who in Europe remains attached to them. So in other words, still an art is a Chinese melody. It has been appropriated. So nobody is going to tell the Chinese faithful how they will be synthesizing their face. Okay? Here in another image, it sees a um, workshop of uh, devotional objects in Shanghai. So you have a machine that does candles and a calendar which is printed by the Shanghai diocese. Okay. This having been said, what could be the task ahead that would be respectful of all sensitivity? Okay. We have to start, as I said, from the fact that Chinese Christians are on the defensive, and I noted that by interviewing Shanghainese Catholic who really want to keep the apparatus, I would say, of traditional Chinese Catholicism. At the same time, they are more preoccupied with problems having to do with the church inner transformation than with any political issue. But they are called to be inventive. The pressing nature of the government request compelled them to enter into dialogue so as to deepen their commitment to transfer the gospel into the sign and language of their own people today. Remaining deaf to the call addressed to them, whatever its ambiguity, will put them in a false position, not only toward the government, but especially toward the Chinese for whom Christianity is still a foreign religion. The task is tricky and painful, but inevitable. So three domains in which sinicization may mean something. The first one will be the one of spirituality and spiritual theology. 
which is not presently developed in China. At the same time, that China's spiritual texts and practices are incredibly rich and inspiring. It is one of the tasks of Christians to rediscover, interpret, and appropriate them again. As they did in 18th century, who were reading and reinterpreting classics from Confucianism. So as to make them a treasure, not only for themselves and their own people, but for the whole world. I often remember Father Yves Raguin, founder of the Rich Institute, telling me one day how much he desired to see Chinese spiritual resources, I quote, fully integrated into humankind's spiritual computer. Now, Father Raguin never used the computer in his life. He was using a typewriter, but he had understood the main thing, which is that a computer processes information. And that was the main point, that Chinese spiritual Resources are information to be processed today for the whole world. And cross Christ is other traditions. Second point, engagement with culture, notably with art and literature. Actually, this happens on a large scale from the 1920s to the 1940s, end of the 40s. After 1920s, especially after the first uh, Protestant translation in common Chinese, biblical stories and topics entered the Chinese imagination. And most uh, famous novelists, Mao Dun, Udafu, Bajin, Guomojo, all used uh, narratives that were coming from the Bible. And Chen Duxiu, the first general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, expelled from it in 1929, reminded young Chinese intellectuals in a famous article that, I quote, Christianity is the good news of the poor and Jesus is the friend of the poor. Though so there is a cultural uh, asset, set of assets, which is here. Such interaction, and I could quote something for painting, for instance. Uh, such interaction has been less intense during the last decades, and Christians have been led to develop references of vocabulary of their own, closing their lexical field, if I may say so. Those cultural forms to be reshaped do not need to be explicitly evangelical. They rather need to be infused with the spirit of universality and humanism that the gospel nurtures into the one who worship God, in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4, rather than through fixed places and rituals. Cultural transfer has been happening all the time. Here you have the Anverton Bible brought to China in the 17th century. This is the scene of the visitation, and you have its rendering into Chinese art. That kind of things happened thousands of times. Okay. Third domain in which uh, sinicization may be sourced and slowly implemented, social awareness and action. Let's quote another passage from Xi Jinping's address to the 19th Congress. The more prominent problem is that our development is unbalanced and inadequate. This has become the main constraining factor in meeting the people's increasing needs for a better life. We must devote great energy to addressing developments in balances and inadequacies and push hard to improve the quality and effect of development. There is a call to action here. Here is a picture of a group of Chinese, of uh, Shanghai Catholics in a Shanghai parish. It's quite interesting. It's an initiative to learn foot massage to people who can teach this to migrant workers in order to help migrant workers to get a job. It's not so, uh, it's a small session, but it's not small scale. Now it's all throughout Shanghai. So you've got dozens of sessions that way that teach foot massage as a way of integrating people for a given need. And other Catholics use it for going into communities where you have many older people, for instance, for taking care of them. Just a way to say that there is a creativity that can be developed in order to answer a call to a more integral development. It is not theorized by Chinese Christians, but it's felt. 
sure the restrictions imposed upon religious organizations make it very difficult to them to play an active part in such struggle toward just society offering to all equal opportunities. There are still few Catholic organizations that have done a bit. Of course, the most well-known is Shinde in Rebe and social service of the comparatively rich diocese of Shanghai. Such step, even small, may help Christians to better realize that the challenges of their country are theirs and that initiating personal and collective initiatives directed toward the ones who suffer most from an unbalanced developmental model is a task that requires accrued inventiveness and audacity. My conclusion, we are all aware of the fact that the political system asks from religious communities more obedience than sense of initiative. While asking them to evolve, it deprives them of the legal and material means through which they could achieve significant social presence. But at the same time, both the nature of their faith and the political reality of their countries must encourage Chinese Christians to privilege engagement over retreat. There is something intrinsically risky about the Christian faith. The Chinese authority should also evaluate the risk that they are presently running in a way that differs from their current assessment. Accrued stringent requirements could foster discouragement and resentment within religious communities, and we are not far from it. Their overcomprehensive understanding of what national security encompasses may lead them to be so restrictive that they will eventually create risk of discontent and social division that presently do not exist. Chinese authorities are presently creating apprehension within religious circle and beyond, but they are attempt at fostering what could be called a new civil religion. If every nation needs to promote a repertory and symbol and stories to respect and cherish, the way national symbol stories and values are presently sacralized in China gives the impression, I say gives the impression, that the state is progressively building up a new cult which traditional religion will be asked to refer to. At the same time, the Chinese state presently benefits from a great reservoir of goodwill. Other nations appreciate its economic, political, and military strengths, as well as the positive contribution it is starting to make toward the reorientation of world economy towards green development at its very serious reorientation. Its citizens benefit from almost 40 years of uninterrupted growth. Such capital of goodwill could be lost if a mixture of overconfidence as to the country's strengths and of over-anxiety as to national security will translate into unreasonable requirements and restrictions. If the state opens up a space of dialogue on the ways and means through which religion may better contribute to the nation's social and cultural development, it will ensure China's continuing stability, facilitate its peaceful evolution, and further ascertain the rising status of the country in the world. Christianity can become more Chinese. At the same time, it can help China to become more human, open, and harmonious, and such contribution should be fully welcome. Thanks to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vermander, for this uh, passionate, I would say, presentation with also powerful images. And uh, we move now uh, on to uh, the respondent uh, of Professor Vermander's paper, uh, Professor Peng Xiaoyu, uh, who teaches world history at the Department of History 
and is also a director of the Center for Hellenic Studies at the Peking University. His research areas include history of Western legal system and history of Christian civilization. Uh, among his major publications, uh, uh, there are studies on canon law, history and theory, and uh, Christianity and modern Western nation countries. Professor Peng, uh, the floor is yours for uh, your response. Well, thank you, Dr. Romano. Uh, uh, your eminence and uh, my dear colleagues and friends. Uh, first, my sincere gratitude to the friends at Rome, Hong Kong, and Beijing for this very kind invitation. Uh, actually, this institution is closely related to, my, to quite a few of my professors who were once students on teachers at this university. It is joyful to listen to the presentation just made by Professor Bandumar Vermonde. Uh, actually, we, we, we are friends for quite a few time because we, we heard uh, from each other uh, for, for many, many times. Uh, to such a comprehensive review and uh, excellent uh, analysis, I could only add a few supplementary remarks and hopefully to contribute a bit to the discussion we are to have later. Uh, I, ca I, sh I shortened my, my long written response because, uh, because of, for the sake of saving time. So I have two questions. The first one, was there a substantial continuity between the years before 1949 and those after? in the indifferent and even hostile attitude towards religions in general and to Christianity in particular. Uh, therefore, the second one, if this continuity did and does exist, who are responsible for the formation of this unfriendly attitude? Uh, I will mention only Two of Peking University's former presidents, Mr. Cha Yuanpei and Dr. Hu Shi, both provided a subtext or a concealed paradigm behind almost all dialogues regarding Christianity in China. Uh, I, I always believe that we perhaps have underestimated so far the impact these two scholars exerted upon intellectuals, common people, and the government officials in China. Uh, well, uh, for the convenience of translate, I will skip to the middle of the third page of my paper. Uh, the Jesuit father, uh, John Courtney Murray, uh, who wrote the draft of Dignitatis Humanae, uh, the Vatican II documents, uh, for religious liberty, uh, once said something quite interesting. Murray, in the context of American democracy, was fully confident in the consent or authorization principle that is, through the people's abiding sense of justice, the republic would be safeguarded while the wise people exerted influences on the common people in more complicated issues. Uh, during the 20th century, in some backward regions in China, the want of this sense of justice among people led to the current persecutions of the church and to other violent social disturbances. The formation of a modern nation was a task that have yet, has yet to be completed in China, but the wise men and women have to acquire a lucid mind first, uh, in my opinion. The crisis regarding the fate of Christianity in modern China, in a deeper sense, was an integral part of modern intellectual history of the country. The situation can be vividly demonstrated through the writings and the speeches of Mr. Cha Yuanpei and Dr. Hu Shi. 
Mr. Tsai was also the first Minister of Education for the Republic of China and exerted great influence in national academic and cultural affairs for many years before his death in 1940, whose favorite motto was actually that aesthetics substitute for religions. In his opinion, China had no deep-rooted religious traditions. Many of you uh, would uh, disagree. Uh, so China had no deep-rooted religious tradition in the first place, and in modern times, the, the development of country would depend upon science and humanities. Confucius, according to Mr. Tsai, never had, well, I cannot believe it, never had a spiritual life that had any connection with religion's belief and was thoroughly secular. In his interview with the Journal of Young China Association in 1921, he claimed that China and the rest of the world would, would see the disappearance of religions in the near future. In 1922, the members of that association joined other radical students in launching the anti-Christian movement that shook the country and lasted until 1927. What Mr. Tsai said about religion was not different from the viewpoints put forth by Dr. Hu Shi, a disciple of Zhang Dui and an important member of the nationalist government. Uh, he, he had served, uh, he served uh, in such prestigious posts as the president of Peking University and the ambassador of ROC to the US. Dr. Hu's indifference to and the polemic stand against Christianity uh, were not surprising because Dewey, his teacher, was an anti-Catholic veteran in the American intellectual world and a powerful, of course, academic guru. This connection between the master and disciple in their attitude toward the religions has rarely been mentioned uh, you know, during past decades. Politically, as, dem as a Democrat, just as the Doctor Who was facing the issue raised in the Gospel of Mark and treated by Murray in his essays about Christianity and human values. Look, Master, what wonderful stones and buildings. Dr. Hu was indeed an admirer of the Western civilization and tried very hard to realize an organic assimilation of the Western civilization into the Chinese culture without damaging displacement. For many years, he endeavored to promote a gradual reformist plan of democratization and modernization in the society. He remained for his life, however, a man of the May Force movement and persisted in his anti-Christian prejudice. For him, the Western culture implied democracy and science with no connection at all with Christian faith and morality. Uh, he said once, I have never believed in any gods since my childhood, and reading classical Chinese authors only strengthened my atheistic conviction because it taught me not to be fearful of hell and ghosts. He learned from Dewey that a truth that is ready for men to accept without questioning is not truth at all, such as Christian faith and morality. His famous sneer at Christianity runs as the following. Christian faith promises heaven, future, and eternal life. For me, it is like a void check of one million US dollars. I would rather to take in my hand one silver dollar instead. He once wrote impassionately, I will strive by myself. I might win and my, I might lose, but I will always shoulder my own responsibility without beseeching freedom from others 
and without seeking help from Jesus Christ, I will not let him die for me. Depend on ourselves rather than on heaven or God, he pleaded, and let us give up the dream of the kingdom of heaven. We shall build a paradise on earth by ourselves. Did he sound like a communist denounced in the Catholic journals, both in China and in the United States during the last century? As a matter of fact, both Mr. Tsai and Dr. Hu opposed the resistance to socialism and the Communist Party. They at the same time con consi consistently demonstrated indifference and even hostility to the issue of social justice. Their renunciation of both religion and socialism constitutes a sort of cultural schizophrenia, a peculiar modern version of enlightenment with Chinese characteristics. Uh, I skip to page 11. Uh, it's, it's too long as a response. Uh, oh, but I guess I had a nutshell of what I... Okay, thank you. Oh, there are still a lot of stuff. Uh, liberal intellectuals such as Mr. Tai Yuanpei and Dr. Hu Shi were convinced that religion is harmful to the modernization of, of the country. And thus, it had better be got rid of or at least push the side of the mainstream. Today, we still have numerous scholars who share the opinions elaborated by Dr. Hu and Mr. Tsai uh, Well, in a sense, the number is growing with more graduates returning, from, returning home from European and American universities. Uh, a lot of us actually often forget that we had the Christian faith from the West. We also had a lot of anti-Christian biases from the West as well. So I guess this is a point we, we should not overlook anymore. Uh, in that case, just as Father John Cotton Murray teaches that people's abiding, abiding sense of justice cannot be sustained in the context of belief. In man without transcendence reference, and thus a modern civilized living is going to be a mirage rather than a reality. I think it's a lesson that uh, a lot of Chinese scholars and intellectuals had had high time uh, to keep it in mind. Uh, I often wonder Without the Chinese right controversy, what would have happened? Would the emperor have been converted together with the nation? If missionaries and the faithful of all denominations in Christianity had paid enough attention to the problematic side of enlightenment and to more recent Western secularism and had made adequate efforts to discredit and demolish both, starting with a comprehensive conversation with non-Christian intellectuals blocked together with them in argument and driven by charity to educate others, would the state of Christianity in particular and that of religion in general have been totally different uh, in China? Uh, I do not know, uh, but uh, I'm always, I am always hopeful. Uh, I would like to cite one example regarding Dr. Hu Shi, because he served as the president for many years at Peking University, and also, I guess, played leading roles in uh, educational affairs. But actually, Peking University, before the 1949, uh, also, Yanjing University, run by American Protestant missionaries, never had a decent collection of Western classics. We do not have, I don't, we can, I cannot say we do not have one copy, but basically we do not have 
any substantial collection of church fathers. So having bid farewell to Dr. Hu Shi and Mr. Chai Yuanpei, now Peking University uh, and its library, I guess the Peking University Library has collected almost all Christian classics uh, in major languages. So I could say we do not, we do not lack any works of Church Fathers now. We have all the major collections edited in Europe. Uh, well, this is really, uh, it's very open-minded and this is exceedingly great achievement. Uh, because Dr. Vermonte mentioned that uh, how we should understand the Sinitization Zhongguo uh, Hua, in my personal opinion, to fully understand and appreciate the richness of the Western traditions may well be one of the most important aspects of Sinitization. Uh, actually, Dr. Vermonde dressed in Chinese style. I dressed up in, well, sort of the Western style. I guess this kind of humili hum humility, <laughs> humble attitude uh, uh, is always uh, needed uh, in the process of evangelization. Uh, an attitude of defensiveness is, is really not a good medicine. Uh, for the future. Uh, I hope uh, the above uh, quite a brief response is helpful and uh, I also beg critique from Professor Vermonde and my colleagues and everybody in audience here. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Pong, for this uh, dense, I would say, and uh, thought-provoking response you gave to us. And uh, before, uh, we have half an hour for the discussion, if I may, before uh, I open uh, um, the floor for the questions and reactions, I would just pick up a few points that have been raised during these quite uh, meaningful presentations. The, the much debated, the recent call for sinicization, for sinicization uh, which actually is a process that comes from far, it's uh, early on, uh, but today has a new connotation, a political connotation, uh, and it also bears a, a sort of uh, vagueness of ambiguity. Should Chinese Christians uh, reject it because com it comes from government? How sh should, could they respond to that? Um, again, it comes back uh, the, the issue of uh, Catholicism as a religion at the margin or even heterodox religion comes back from previous uh, speakers, how to make it more Chinese. Um, the heavy burden of uh, colonial humiliation, cultural insensitivity of foreign missionaries. Um, uh, and the, this dichotomy uh, the, Christ, the Christ, uh, Chinese Christians fr find themselves uh, in being between being in, uh, uh, inventive, creative, or defensive. Uh, and uh, last two points: uh, the, the the role of the uh, the elite of Chinese scholars educated in Western world in shaping back, in shaping up an environment that was hostile to religion in general, but specifically Christianity, uh, contributing to the de-Christianization de process and anti-Christian sentiments in China, and even uh, uh, against socialism, hence um, uh, influencing, influencing conservative positions uh, of the Chinese Catholics uh, on social, some, at least some social issues. And again, is Chinese a religious country? This question again comes back uh, and um, so I think we have a lot on our plate and uh, I open uh, the session for uh, your questions and any feedback or comment. Again, if you could identify yourself, please. Okay, yeah, over there, I see. <coughs> uh, if 
a great, very grateful and appreciation for the lectures of this morning. My name is uh, Jiao Wanling. I come from Hong Kong, and I'm of the Fukulani movement, Pu Shi Bai Yong Dong. As a Chinese living in Italy for 38 years, I would like to forward two questions. The first one is, in this era of uh, globalization, very much uh, uh, accelerated, I think the chi China is a as a nation, and also the Chinese people, especially among the young generations, they are very much open, and they are trying to go out of the country to reach the West, not only the West, but other continents. So would you consider this as a help to facilitate the process of interculturality, interculturality among the East and the West? Because in a way that maybe also the West as a whole block, uh, but of course embracing all the other, uh, could also uh, better understand and also uh, better approach the Chinese cultures and in a way that we can also collaborate on the common <coughs> issues for the human good. Uh, taking also in this uh, consideration that, for example, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, for example, they have always been uh, places of uh, openness, di dialogical, and could they be uh, serve as a bridge uh, to connect these two, two worlds and these two cultures? The first question. Second question is, um, uh, in, uh, maybe today in China and also in other Chinese communities all spread all over the world, there seems to be a new category of uh, cultural Christians. I mean, those people who may not decide to uh, ask for baptism, and they would never become a Christian, a, a Baptist Christian. However, they would like to learn, to know, to deepen, and also to put into practice all the good values that is contained in these religions. For example, the the values, the teachings contained in the Gospels. But they will never become Christians. So I, I, I would like to, uh, to know, uh, is this a role for this uh, category of cultural Christians? And, and many times they are also scholars, theologians, philosophies. So, so they really studied the doctrines of the Christian's doctrines. So what are their role and could they be a help to the remodelating of the Chinese churches, Catholic okay. church or, or others. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I guess the, this is addressed to Professor Vermander or uh, with Professor Vermander, would you like to take this one? This Very okay. quickly, I think, because the uh, answers are partly already in the question. Yes, of course, globalization and uh, internalization uh, <coughs> interaction helps to mutual understanding. Yes, Hong Kong and Taiwan, through their specific positioning, still have an inc incredibly important role to play. I'm really convinced of it. Um, we just have to realize, as Professor Pong has said it very clearly, that more exposure to the West of more globalization is not necessarily what we would think good for Christianity, at least in its traditional form that it's not Christianity against Chinese culture, it's for Christianity against a form of contemporary Western culture. So that many Christians now are <coughs> skeptical or reject Christianity because they are Westernized, okay? And uh, I will qualify actually this, actually this statement very quickly. What you call cultural Christians, is, this is true, but it is evolving and it is ambiguous because the expression was used in the 80s for speaking of a group of intellectuals, mainly. And now very few intellectuals in China will call themselves cultural Christians. It's out of fashion. On the other hand, on the other hand, the reality has been popularized, which means that you have more and more Chinese who are deeply influenced by Christian values and narrative, but wouldn't consider to be baptized. 
Now, I happened to consider it as a chance, and uh, I connected to the first remark. What I mean by that is that I, mean for I meet, for instance, regularly in Shanghai, young people who just met the Bible and read the Bible by group of 10 or whatever. You could call them Protestants. I don't call them Protestants. I call them Christians. That just a discovery in all its novelty. <coughs> well, I quoted John Ford, not totally uh, by chance, you know. There can be different theology, but there is a theology in John, notably, that calls faith in Christ and God to go beyond the model of religion. So I will not develop that, that's not the place, but there is something in Christianity that goes beyond what we call religion. And China might be a laboratory in which Christianity is looking for a new, uh, unheard of, unheard of uh, forms and way of living the faith. And I'm really convinced of it. I'm really convinced that in this call of worshiping God, not in a place, but in truth and spirit, there is something that China can help us to implement. Thank you, Professor Pang. Oh, oh yes, uh, I'd just like to say uh, uh, a little regarding the second question, I guess. Uh, you have to refer this to, to the Holy Scripture and uh, the, the most uh, holy is the Pope, right? I mean, as regarding your second question. I mean, this is not, uh, <coughs> it's not our duty to answer that. Yeah. Okay, I think we go first over there and then there and there. Okay. Then left and then back. No, it's okay. Now first, please. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, I have two questions for both professors. And uh, first is, uh, could you just uh, clarify some uh, concepts or elements uh, whatsoever about your understanding about Zhongguo uh, Hua? Uh, and the second is, uh, in your understanding, uh, what's your understanding about uh, Zhongguo Hua and the inculturation in your uh, thinking? And for both professors, thank you. Okay. Shall we start with Professor Peng? Professor, go first. Professor Lermander? <laughs> Actually, the problem is not my understanding of Professor Pong and myself understanding of Zhongguo Hua, but what is the <laughs> understanding of the relevant authority of actors in the game. So uh, I try to give you some hints of the fact that Zhongguo Hua is indeed a political concept. I, I think it's true, better to be clear, so I'm not polemical when I say that, that the present understanding of Zhongguo Hua by the authority is first that religions have somehow to conform to the ideal of socialism with Chinese characteristics and to enter into a model of governance which is Chinese as it is today. So it does include inculturation, but it doesn't start from inculturation. It starts from a political positioning that uh, has as a consequence a certain view of, incul of inculturation. At the same time, everything I quote remains vague. And I really looked at all the recent texts in the last uh, year, more or less, including the ones which are presented to people <coughs> who go to study sessions, because there are a lot of study sessions since November, and they are met with text especially uh, from uh, exegesis from people of the Institute of Socialism or the Institute of uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Science and so on. And it doesn't say more than what I have presented. I think I have presented the totality of the corpus, which means it remains vague, yes, uh, enter into the new era that, Chinese, uh, that China is entering into. And while doing that, try to express your faith in a way that will be 
both akin with Chinese uh, traditional expressions and with the modern spirit of China or contemporary spirit of China. Of course, this gives a lot of interpretation. And what I proposed after that was to play on the possibility for interpretation and to enter into a dialogue in which the state and religions through an interaction will define further what Zhongguo Hua could entail. Now, don't accuse me of uh, being, uh, how I would say that, uh, 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 overtly optimistic. I know that this kind of dialogue doesn't happen in an equal setting. But uh, it's rare that the dialogue is completely equal. So you dialogue and you... So uh, I'm totally conscious of the frailty of my position, but I don't see any other way to proceed. And in any case, we shouldn't be the one <coughs> to take too absolute a definition of Zhong Guo because the best is to give some freedom of interpretation to the theme. Oh, oh, well, uh, uh, actually, I have been thinking about the issue for a while. Hmm? Huh? Oh, it's all right. I mean, I have been thinking about the issue for a while uh, because I maybe I can say that I spend uh, all my life uh, in studying the Western culture and uh, and learning from the West. Uh, I don't know if I have personal bias, but uh, I always believe that helpfulness of being defensive in culture is at most dubious and doubtful. Um, it could be very dangerous. Uh, and after the, the reform and the openness, uh, many of us I mean, in the universities uh, feel that uh, we are making great progress in this aspect. I remember I saw the famous Professor Du Weiming together with a few American scholars in our library. Dr. Du was not familiar with the collection in the library, so he said to the American professors, uh, we have good collections of uh, Chinese classics, but not the Western works, particularly the, you know, the classical uh, <coughs> Western works, including Church of Others. Uh, I happen to stand just uh, you know, behind them, and uh, it's not good, but I heard it. Then I told the doctor do that uh, this is wrong. Since 1986, uh, Peking University bought every, all collection, collections of uh, famous or uh, well-known, like Monumenta, Germania, Historica, and other uh, big uh, printed uh, collections of Western documents, historical documents. So I don't know. I mean, we cannot be using sinicization as an excuse to uh, to be hesitant uh, in learning from the West. And we met so many Western professors, European professors, American professors, like Professor Vermonde. They always told us, oh, uh, uh, we, 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 all res we are also respectful of Chinese culture. And uh, in the context of colonialism and imperialism, it is quite understandable. But I don't think uh, in today's world, uh, we perhaps should uh, also, I mean, as Chinese scholars, we could also say to Professor Vermonti that uh, we Chinese scholars should be very humble and very active in learning from the West. Why not? I mean, the, the, the Western tradition they have so many aspects. There are, there are many aspects are very good for, for, 
for the improvement of our society. Yeah. I hope that satisfies you. Thank you. I saw this. Okay. Um, my name is Zhang Chongfu. I come from Sichuan University. Uh, I really appreciate your um, both professors' uh, presentation and the reply. Uh, <coughs> I uh, really enjoy the professor Fernandez uh, uh, mentioned the spiritual theology, uh, and not this word. So, um, but also uh, I would like to f uh, give me uh, 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 questions uh, for for this. Uh, you mentioned uh, um, uh, it's better for fully integrate Chinese traditional culture with Christianity. Uh, I. I my question is, uh, um, the spiritual, uh, this is, uh, you, perhaps I, I understand you mentioned this uh, spiritual theology. Um, is that it's a, a touch the really core of the both, I mean, Chinese traditional culture and the Christianity? Uh, or just a, a, a superficial, uh, it's, uh, use some symbolic elements like, uh, uh, Chinese note or Thai, some sort of whatever mixed in the Christianity, or I mean, for example, uh, if we touch the very core of this, uh, we mentioned uh, as a mature rich um, uh, after mature riches, uh, the right controversy. Uh, controversy. So, in China, polytheism. Christianity is a monotheism. How do you resolve this? So, on the other hand, how do you treat the ancestorship? So, if we just we meet some, I don't think it's, a, it's an important symbolic sense into Christianity. It doesn't work. You cannot resolve the problems, the conflicts. So, um, um, so. Um, for my opinion, I, I don't think this is a, is a can't find a way to resolve it. Mm -hmm. It's just a different. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> it's better if we um, keep the dialogue and respect each other. This is the most important method, perhaps. So, I'd like to listen to both professors' uh, response. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's a really important question, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to specify let's say, the programmatic part of what I said, because I mentioned three tasks ahead in uh, culturation, whatever you want. One, I said, was to uh, had to do with spirituality and spiritual theology. In this, I didn't speak about culture. And the second one, had to do with um, the field of culture and especially art and literature. So I would like to specify the difference I do between the two. Um, Chinese spirituality, let's say spiritual tradition since the time of its early writing is one of the expressions of the quest of the inner world in humanity. So it's not first a question of culture. Of course, it is cultural if you want. But what is interesting is how in different settings in the world, humankind has trying to enter into an experience of his inner world. And you can call it also an experience of the outer world. The problem is to explore the world of spiritual consciousness within one. So this is something different. This is not about, you know, doing cultural work and so on. This is taking seriously Chinese spiritual quest as one of the expression of humankind's inner quest. Okay. So I want to develop that. This is a quest which is not cultural, which is indeed about the commonality of spiritual experience. Another one is a world of culture and literature, indeed. On that one, I was calling Chinese Christians to be 
bolder or to be interested again in that uh, experience, which means to integrate their culture and or their faith and cultural creativity. So I was giving an example in my talk, which I couldn't take uh, uh, when speaking, but I will take it now for being more specific of what I sourced. It is the painter Lin Feng Mian. So Lin Feng Mian is first a very classical Chinese painter who also studied Western painting in Belgium. And uh, during Cultural Revolution, he is severely persecuted. So he will destroy more than 2,000 of his works. After that, he will finish by being exiled in New York. He will often, many, many, many times, draw paintings on Chinese media that describe the crucifixion of Christ. But what he does is basically to make this a healing process, which means he uses all the resources of calligraphy of Chinese painting in its diversity, but also of the art of color he studied from Western painting in order to make this experience of suffering the one through which he can come to terms with his experience. So I'm not speaking about a kind of programmatic creation of symbols, you know. I don't believe about a cross with a little lotus on top of it, things like that. No, it cannot be done that way. What I'm speaking about is a deep creative process in which through Christian texts and experiences and through the media which are yours, you created our works in which people can identify the struggles and the expectations that are theirs. So in both cases, if you want, I speak about something that goes to the inner, not a kind of program of doing Chinese Christian works. Because we have been doing that and it doesn't go very far. You know, The things we are doing always are done at a personal and emotional level but we have an array of resources for doing them. And we can find many, many Chinese artists, and I could quote many other names, who have done exactly that. And Western artists too, because Chinese art, of course, becomes a medium, and Chinese culture becomes a medium for artists, intellectuals, and so on, cultural creators from any country in the world. Oh, wow. Uh, well, we, we have good chemistry between uh, two speakers uh, because I'm also a big fan of um, painter Lin Feng Mian. Uh, I, I don't think I, I should say any more because uh, uh, Professor Vermonti already uh, answered the, the qu question. Uh, uh, but I, 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 we had a talk between the coffee, uh, in the coffee break uh, uh, Yes, I mean, in, t in talking, in discussion about uh, the integration of the, the two cultures, I mean, Chinese culture, uh, Christian culture, uh, uh, maybe we should look at some uh, examples. For example, the, the case of Japan, uh, the case in, in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. Uh, because even if, I don't think it's possible, even if we go all the way in, in open society to Christianity, um, to, to, what ex to what extent we can, uh, the term I, I use it with, with, with a quote, to what extent we can Christianize China? I mean, look at the Japan. Uh, so the, the conclusion is no fear. I mean, fear is perhaps, I mean, it's not a healthy element in, in for our society. So maybe a, if we can exclude the fear in our mentality towards the cultures in the world, uh, I guess the, the great country uh, will be more even more greater. I mean, China has, uh, well, everybody uh, 
praise it. China has great cultural heritage, and uh, it is today doubtless is uh, econ not only an economic power, but it's becoming uh, a great country in many other aspects. So we, we I, I personally, I do feel we have no need to fear uh, of Christianization, if I can use the term. Uh, I don't know, I mean, we, we rarely use the term. Uh, we, we talk about the Christianization of the Roman Empire, uh, but uh, in the modern times, we are very, we have been very careful in, in using such terms. Uh, but uh, the integrity of Chinese civilization, I guess, is powerful and strong enough uh, for us to uh, get rid of this kind of fear. Uh, well, uh, this is my personal opinion. Okay, I saw two more people. If uh, I can call for brevity in the questions, please. The, who was over there, raised his hand, and another one over there. I think we take this uh, last two, but please, please be, be, be brief, and I'm also asking the, our panelists to please be brief. Okay, I go first. Um, in the talk of uh, Professor Benoa, uh, correct name, uh, you give us a very positive um, uh, view that uh, Christians helped a lot uh, in many aspects in the history of China um, and also there are many other um, great things done in the history especially you mentioned that uh, even the chairman of China mentioned that uh, since confronting the problems nowadays that um, the society uh, needs um, the value, especially maybe from the uh, Christians uh, and other many uh, aspects to help to build a better and a higher quality of uh, uh, Chinese uh, society. This is very good, uh, I'm very happy. But from another talk of uh, Professor Peng, it seems that, uh, uh, I don't know, Professor Peng, see, because I don't remember. Um, I, and also I don't know if I correctly understood you. Um, it seems you are giving a negative side of uh, Christianity in China, because you are seeing that um, this uh, uh, lecturer, uh, Chinese lecturer Hu Shi, he had a very bad view of uh, Christianity, and he himself is an, was an atheist. And uh, almost in the end, you are mentioning that uh, he sorry. is. I'm sorry to interrupt. We, sh we said this should be brief. So, can you yeah. make your question? Then we move to the other question and we respond, yeah. and we have to close. Please. Yeah, okay. Um, so how can we bridge uh, these two Opposition. conflicts? Yeah, it seems conflicts to bring the Christianity to, to China or the attitude from Professor Peng that um, we don't need or it is really a hindrance uh, for the de development of China. I would like uh, Professor Peng to answer the question. Okay. Thanks. The Last question, and then we. we I, I do not really understand we very well. Uh, do you mind we hear the. Yes, yes. So that please. then we, yes, we close. Yes. The last one? Last question? Yeah, the question first. Uh, I'm Li Bing Chuan from Zemin University. A question to Professor Wei Mingde uh, about uh, similarization. Uh, and we all know there are already many efforts in past centuries to make Christian more Chinese such as uh, indigenous, pre indigenous theology and Western Sino Christian theology. But it's quite different, seems it's quite different with what we are talking about Sinaizism today. Huh? Uh, it seems there are two can or two directions of Sinaizism. One is from the part of Christianity to 
using Chinese culture to introduce Chin Christian Christianity into Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. Another way is another uh, way around to, to make foreign uh, religions or even native religions mm -hmm. uh, adapt themselves uh, uh, to the uh, current uh, social and political context. Whatever, I think, for my understanding, such kind of uh, inter interaction is, not, is never a uh, one-way operation. There's always a mutual transformation involved. My question is, do you think, uh, talking about the, uh, what you mentioned, the political concept about signalization, do you think any, uh, is there, there is a space for Christianity uh, in Chinese society uh, without losing its identity as Christianity? Or just like per Professor Yang just mentioned, the case of uh, Buddhism, is there any possibility for Christianity becoming a native Chinese religion, no longer a foreign religion? This is my question. OK, thank, thank you. you. Shall we start from Professor Feng now? Oh, it's all right, yeah. Uh, I, I do not really understand. Uh, maybe I did not understand you correctly. Uh, Because uh, in the society, uh, in the modern society, we always uh, meet two opposing powers. Uh, one is uh, pro Christianity, and the other one very often uh, against against it. But but in in the history of modern China, an an anti-Christian attitude is not limited to to the Chinese society after 1949. This is a century-long tradition. I, sometimes I, I would like to say this is the tradition. Uh, it's even stronger uh, before the 1949, because we are kind of sometimes the fact uh, is obscured uh, by so many uh, disturbing political movements. But if we take out all those political movements after 1949, I do not see much difference between the Republic of China and uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, this phenomenon happens because of Dr. Hu Shi and uh, the intellectuals like him. Oh, I guess I talked already sufficiently. Try to be as brief as possible, trying uh, to summarize all the points. First point, uh, um, uh, I, I don't think I've been optimistic. On the contrary, I said all the time, the problem is to avoid two traps. The first trap is blind obedience. The second trap is defensiveness. And I'm seeing if there is a point on which Professor Pong and I have said the same thing, is being defensive leads nowhere. So no need to be defensive. Second, I try to avoid as much as possible expression just as making Christianity more Chinese because it just doesn't work that way. I mean, inculturation happens all the time, naturally, from below. Third point, in that view, Chinese Christian community, be they Protestant or Catholic, are already very Chinese. Any anthropologist will tell you that. You look at systems of power, interaction between people and so on, they are completely Chinese. And it couldn't be otherwise. They are completely Chinese already. So I say the problem is not a program, but what I call a blueprint, and I make a difference between the two, with this idea going out, not being defensive, but saying that there are tasks. And those tasks basically are not defined by the government, but by the gospel. But there are several people, the world and the gospel, calling Christian, Chinese Christian to continuous transformation. We should be very humble to ask them to transform, because they have been transforming all the time already. And they have been compelled to transform much more than the Western churches. So it's not fair somehow that there are the people, the churches who have been already subjected to a lot of challenges, who still meet challenges. Okay. But it is the case. So I try to define some tasks 
in which Chinese Christians are compelled to be even more Christians. At the end of the day, will it make Christianity Chinese or uh, rooted? I say there will be only two things. I'm sure there always will be grassroots Chinese Christian communities worshipping together. Many or few, but there will be always some worshipping Chinese Christian communities. And there will be, I hope, a kind, and here I take the expression of Professor Pong, Christianization of China, which means that values and behaviors inspired by the gospel will permeate the role of Chinese society. Thank you so much. Before we close the session, just two, three reminders. One is that there, uh, the, the people uh, uh, holding their badges are kindly invited uh, to gather uh, at the main entrance of the university at 2.30 p.m. for a group photo. And the same group of people, uh, we could please go for lunch immediately after the closing of the session in uh, um, the Manzoni room. And then for everybody, for all of us, we shall resume uh, for the second session at 3 p.m. Uh, I would thank our distinguished panelists, uh, all of you for your attendance, and a round of applause for them. Thank you.